Hello, welcome to chapter four. We are going to uh, talk about energy and cellular metabolism, which is a fancy way of uh, saying another scary word, which is uh, biochemistry. I don't want you to fear biochemistry. It's, it's not as complicated as it might seem, especially if you've had 165 and you've had organic chemistry, hopefully. Um, we're going to try to make this as digestible, if you will, as possible. We're going to break this lecture up into two, uh, two sub-videos, part uh, one and part two. This is part one. Uh, we're going to hopefully help you better understand something like this figure right here, which can be incredibly confusing. But with a little bit of background, a little bit of lecture here, you should be able to do just fine. So hang with me and please bring your questions to class. So about this chapter, the fundamental goal here is to delineate on a physiologic level this process of taking this energy inputs and converting it into things that, for instance, allow you to run a 100-yard dash or to get up out of your chair and drive to the university or walk to class or turning this into the signals that are comprise our thoughts, emotions, and uh, psyche uh, or any number of things. But there's also the process of, uh, as we do that, heat loss, we're losing energy in this process, but we're also having to eliminate uh, materials that are no longer serve that purpose in the form of waste. Uh, we talk about metabolism and so forth. So that's it's about energy flow, but we're taking it to the next level because so much of us understand this stuff intrinsically. Now it's time to take it to the next level. So we're going to talk about energy and biologic systems a little bit, uh, potential and kinetic energy and so forth. Where the meat of this lecture really goes is in like, for instance, the anatomy of a chemical reaction. So we're going to take, you know, those of you who haven't had a ton of chemistry, you might have seen some of this. A lot of this is, is to help set up those folks who are going to be taking uh, standardized tests or thinking about graduate school. Uh, but we're just going to touch on it to help you have a, a fundamental understanding of what, uh, what energy flow really means and why we need enzymes. Metabolism, we're going to talk about it writ large for sure, you know, just a little bit. But where we're really going to delve into is how metabolism is controlled at the individual reaction level and not those big all-encompassing uh, flow charts that you see from time to time that we call quote-unquote metabolism. And the real big side of this is enzymes. So the, the heart of our, our lecture today is going to be about enzymes. These guys help control metabolism and help control chemical reactions. Well, then the question is, how do we control the controllers? If these guys control, how do we control them, if you know what I mean? So that's the fundamental question for our enzyme section of the lecture today. So a little bit about energy. You have heard some of this before, and you might have learned some of uh, some of the you know Newton's laws and that sort of thing. We talk about energy as the capacity to do work. Well, what does that really mean? Right? That's sort of ambiguous to me. It's really about mass and the capacity to change the motion of that mass. If you're talking about this, uh, like an object flying through the air, or you're talking about how that object, how hot it is, or whether that object is releasing light, those are all different forms of motion, just different levels uh, uh, of where that motion is occurring. And so I would say energy is the capacity to change the motion of mass. I think that's a better way of putting it. And hopefully you'll be able to see that as, as I do, I hope so. But in any case, let's talk about different kinds of, of work that that capacity that energy has the ability to do, making and breaking of chemical bonds. When we make a chemical bond, what we're doing is we're storing energy uh, for potentially later use. So we make a chemical bond. We might have to invest energy to make that bond if it's not really used to release energy. It might be for an infrastructure. But nevertheless, energy is stored when we make a bond. And energy is released to do other things, changing the motion of what's involved in, in, chem, in when we break a chemical bond. 
We also have transport work that is like, for instance, moving ions from the intracellular compartment to the extracellular or vice versa, moving molecules, and that can be across tissues or through uh, cells, you name it. Uh, even larger particles in some cases. Like for instance, transport work might involve uh, muscular motion and contraction, contraction to, to cause what we call bulk flow. Very useful transport work for creating concentration gradients. And here's an example of where we're converting energy. We're taking bulk motion, moving an ion, and that sets up a gradient for a different kind of motion. And then we have mechanical work. For instance, muscular contraction, moving organelles, changing cell shape, flagella, and so forth. Contracting muscles. Again, what we might do is contract muscles in order to move, uh, move uh, blood, for instance, and that creates a concentration gradient out of the tissue that allows for exchange. Now, I might be talking really fast here. I hope I'm not getting ahead of what, uh, what you can envision, but these are kind of the three big things that we work on in biological systems. We have two primary forms. We have potential energy, and here are some examples, and kinetic energy over here. Here are some examples. Potential energy is stored energy, either by virtue of the, the chemical bonds that it contains, the concentration gradients that exist, or in some cases, the position of where that molecule or, or item is, is an example of uh, potential energy. We also, yeah, but it has to be converted. You can't just... Uh, potential energy is not enough. It has to be transformed into a form of kinetic energy in order for the uh, process to, to be completed. So kinetic energy is motion. It's either a bulk motion, like in the case of uh, your heart squeezing blood through your, your blood vessels, or it can be the heat of, um, uh, of a molecule, uh, the molecular vibration, or even the, uh, the light emission, um, in some cases, are forms of kinetic energy. Always involves some kind of motion. So here's just some couple of fun little stick figures. He's investing chemical energy in order to create potential energy in this object by virtue of its position in a gravitational field. And as soon as we release that uh, object, it will obviously fall down to a lower energy state. It's releasing energy in the form of heat. Okay, But in biologic systems, we often will harness that. So as this is trying to go to a lower energy state, what we will do is trap some of that kinetic energy and use it for other purposes. We call that phenomenon coupling, where we couple an energy releasing reaction with something that, that requires energy. And in just in you know examples here, I've just got some pictures of some things where we're converting the chemical energy inside the the muscles of these horses into mechanical energy that we can then use to do some kind of work. Um, if you uh, are new to to UND or new to Central Indiana, um, this is actually a wonderful uh, place to go if you have a, a couple of days off. It's Spring Mill State Park. They have a lovely example of where they're coupling uh, water moving down its graph, you know, from potential energy by virtue of potential energy in a gravitational field into uh, motion that grinds up corn. And they have really, really great corn meal there. This discussion about energy flow and conversion of energy is, is fundamentally one of the topic of bioenergetics. And there's a lot of interest in this because if you understand where the energy is, you understand when, you know, when things are going to happen and when they aren't. And you can take this to a, a mathematical level. Um, and so you can actually make arguments about whether a process is occurring or not based on the, the amount of energy that you know is involved. Where we're going to go now is into the idea of chemical reactions and where you have something that's reacting to become something else. And the idea that that will occur at a given rate based on how much energy is, uh, potential energy is available and how much of that energy is released either as a byproduct or how much of that energy drives something else in the reaction. That's a key thing. How much energy is it going to take to get this started? 
in biologic systems, you're talking about fine shades of, of difference between um, the, the reactants and the products. There's a relatively small changes in energy. And so they may not be necessarily spontaneous under the given conditions. And so what we have to do is we have to either modulate how much energy is there, like in the form of temperature, or find some way to make the reaction more spontaneous. The more active ener activation energy is required, the less spontaneous that reaction will be. And there are some reactions that may not occur for billions and billions of years just because there usually isn't enough energy to cause it to happen. For instance, let's say you have a sheet of paper in front of you and if you have one, just grab it. You hear mine here. You can turn this sheet of paper into carbon dioxide very, very rapidly by simply lighting a match. And the next thing you know, the paper is on fire and, and a lot of it's being converted into carbon dioxide. Some of it's being converted into ash. Happens relatively quickly. That can happen spontaneously as well. If we take this sheet of paper and we put it in a, you know, put it somewhere for a thousand years, when we come back, a lot of that paper has spontaneously turned into carbon dioxide. That's why paper, old newspapers turn brown and age and so forth and get very, very brittle because the material is literally turning into carbon dioxide. It's not a very spontaneous reaction. By adding activation energy in the form of a cigarette lighter, you can speed up the reaction quite a bit and make it spontaneous. That's the point of enzymes. That's the point of enzymes. En enzymes lower the need for activation energy and make the reaction more spontaneous under physiologic conditions. We oxidize glucose all the time. If you had a pile of glucose sugar on your table and you lit it on fire, it would burn at somewhere between 500 and 750 degrees. Well, we don't burst into flames. We, we oxidize that glucose in a controlled way so that we only need our temperatures to be somewhere around 90, 98.6 degrees Fahrenheit, or a little even a little less than that. It's another way of indicating temperature sensitivity is how much activation energy is required. Then we have this other concept, and, and this is probably the one time we'll talk about this, other than endergonic and exergonic. It's, it's, but it, it does show up on standardized tests. We call this the delta G, the Gibbs free energy. How much energy is released into the environment because of the reaction, or how much energy does it absorb? When it releases, it has a negative delta G. When it absorbs, it has a positive delta G. But that's really all I'm going to talk about Gibbs free energy. I will show it to you graphically, though, going forward. And here's just an example of what I mean. A diamond is pure carbon. And it can exist for literally billions and billions of years without turning into carbon dioxide. But if you put enough energy in, you have reactants at the right concentrations, in this case, liquid oxygen coupled with lots and lots of heat, you can cause a diamond to uh, literally catch on fire and uh, disintegrate in a matter of seconds. I watched a big fat diamond when I was in high school um, uh, being burned this way on, on, a, on a video. Pretty amazing stuff. If you have enough activation energy, even very non-spontaneous reactions can become spontaneous. So here is an anatomy of a chemical reaction with energy state being on the y-axis. Uh, in this case, we have time on the x-axis. And here's that activation energy. So we have the reactant here, and it may be very, very stable at this level. It contains potential energy, but we have to invest more energy to get over that requirement for energy input. Once it gets over that requirement, then the reaction becomes spontaneous. And what we see is that big ball breaking up into smaller balls, ultimately at a lower energy level. They, uh, they have lost energy it's in the form of heat and molecular vibration. This change from the starting point over here to the final point over here is that delta G that I was talking about. In this case, we've gone from a higher place to a lower one, so this would be a negative delta G because that energy that was in these things has been lost to the environment or kinetic, kinetic motion.
But what an enzyme will do, an enzyme and, and catalysts writ large, catalysts writ large, enzymes are biologic catalysts. Enzymes lower the react the activation energy requirement so that this reaction of, of taking this reactant and, and turning it into products becomes spontaneous at physiologic temperature. That's the key. By lowering the need for activation energy, you make a reaction more sensitive to the energy that's already there. We have energy stored in the, in the chemical bonds here, but we also have the, the object has temperature, right? The environment has temperature and temperature is energy. So if we make this, this activation one flatter and flatter, that means that the energy in the environment may be, may be sufficient to trigger that spontaneity of a chemical reaction. Then what we're going to do in biologic systems is control reactions using those enzymes. And we're also going to control reactions by controlling the enzymes that control the reactions. So it becomes a sort of a sequential. So we got two or three balls in the air now, right? And so enzymes are incredibly important for facilitating uh, reactions in, in, in physiologic conditions by lowering the activation energy requirement. But there's another role for enzymes in biologic systems, and that is to uh, use that energy for something else that, that requires energy. We call that phenomenon coupling. Um, our gr grist mills were examples of coupling. We're releasing the kinetic energy uh, from the stored up gravitational field with water, turning it into kinetic energy in the mill to, in order to break chemical bonds in corn seeds. Okay, That's coupling. We are releasing energy and, and enzymes will facilitate the, the transfer of that energy to something else that requires uh, energy in order to go forward. So we're coupling spontaneous ones, exergonic reactions. Exergonic reactions release energy and we're coupling it to endergonic reactions that will not occur without energy input. So enzymes lower activation energy. Enzymes and enzyme complexes work together to couple endergonic and exergonic reactions. And that's what this figure is showing you here. We've got an exergonic reaction on the top, and we've got an endergonic reaction on the bottom. Negative delta G up here, positive delta G down here. So I've got some terms for you here. Now we, we use those enzymes, we couple those reactions like we have right here, uh, and we call this process metabolism. Now there are different, uh, different uh, meanings behind metabolism. They can be all the chemical reactions that take place in an organism, or we can talk about something being metabolized. We can talk about individual metabolic reactions. For instance, we have catabolic reactions, things that break chemical bonds and release energy. Generally another word for exergonic. Then we have anabolic reactions, things that require energy in order to go forward. Another name for endergonic. When we are doing anabolic, if you ever heard the phrase anabolic steroids, we're building up our muscles. We're going to need to release energy in order for that buildup to occur. And that's coupling. So catab catabolism is breaking down, lowering energy state. The most common reaction for catabolism is hydrolysis, where we use water to break up a polymer like a peptide. We break a peptide into two smaller pieces. What water does is an H goes on one and an OH goes on, on the other, and you now have two smaller pieces using hydrolysis. The other side of it is when we're putting things together, like making polymers, we call that dehydration synthesis because what happens is when you put those two smaller pieces together, like if let's say we're reversing this, you're going to end up with a water molecule out of those pieces. An OH from one molecule and an H from another creates H2O, dehydration synthesis. And many times these things may involve multiple steps. 
this is kind of getting us back to this all chemical reaction thing. If we are, for instance, metabolizing glucose, that's a multi-step pathway. And so we start out with glucose and then we phosphorylate it and we break it into two pieces and, and so forth. Well, after phosphorylating it, now what we have are intermediates and we have multi-steps as we go down the pathway to acetyl-CoA and carbon dioxide. And so here's an example of some biosynthesis. You start actually somewhere down in this area, okay? Somewhere in here, maybe at lanosterol, okay? Very common in plants, by the way. So in, in these arrows here indicate the presence or absence of some kind of a step or a reaction. The numbers here represent specific enzymes. So enzymes will cause, like for instance, enzyme number four here, can convert all of these things over to these final products. I'm not going to test you on a figure like this, but hopefully by the time we're done, you'll be able to understand what it means to go from here to say here. That we start out with a reactant, we have an enzyme that lowers the reaction, the uh, activation energy, probably have some other reactant going on here as well, and we end up with a product, that basic sort of one stepper, if you will. And along the lines of the previous figure, the, the thing I would show you here is that enzymes are the glue of metabolism. And it's amazing how, you know, we tend to take a reaction, we break it out. Um, for instance, um, we have here is, let's see, I'm trying to find it here. I don't see it in here. Oh, yeah, here we start with glucose and we're turning it into acetyl-CoA. Okay, and then we're going to go through the citric acid cycle and we're going to create ATP from this. But we can also create all these other things. They're all connected and the glue that holds it all together are enzymes. So let's have a cheer for enzymes. They're awesome. And that's where medicine really lies if you're talking about uh, helping patients. Um, even if you're not going to give a patient drugs, if you're going to have them work out, what you're doing is you're helping alter their enzymes in places like their heart and their blood vessels and their muscles. Yes, you're doing that. We often think of enzymes as this sort of uh, abstract thing where, that where it's going to react with a substrate is going to create something like a product like, you know, or lysozyme where we, we add proteins and it breaks it down into to amino acids and so forth. And that's fine. But enzymes are really, really important, certainly for making stuff, you know, like building up your muscles, okay, or creating products that we need for other forms of metabolism like ATP and so forth, or we're breaking them down. And these are all fine from an abstract sense. Not particularly exciting, right? Unless you are a biochemist or you want to study cell biology or something. But, but enzymes allow for our muscles to contract. They allow for us to make ATP. In the 21, 22 minutes that you've been sitting with me, you've burned a few pounds of ATP already, so you've got to replenish it. Enzymes are impor important for your thoughts. Without enzymes, we can't move material from the cell body out to the distal end of the axons. We can't sustain gradients for signaling, so and that requires ATP and so forth. Certainly the motor proteins that we talked about before use ATP and energy, and that's an enzyme. These motor proteins are actually an enzyme taking the energy stored from ATP and converting it into motion. Certainly the gradients that we control. And these guys, don't we don't always call enzymes. We don't call protein channels enzymes all that much, but they are catalysts. They are allowing things to move across a plasma membrane that wouldn't otherwise move. The same thing's true with carriers, and we can inhibit them. We can inhibit them just like we can inhibit any other protein in the body. Uh, certain anesthetics are very, very good inhibitors of carrier proteins and channels in our plasma membranes, and they all behave like enzymes. And I realize I'm sort of beginning to beat this to death. I have these slides here, so I'm going to kind of speed up a little bit myself. Enzymes, yes, they speed up the rate of chemical reactions by lowering the activation energy of, uh, of a reaction. So they are a catalyst. And the reason they are considered catalysts is that by the time the reaction is over, they uh, are reverted to their original uh, state. They're generally unchanged. 
Um, the substrates are the reactants oftentimes, what that enzyme binds to and, uh, and does with that, with that molecule. In the case of transporters, I would consider uh, the molecules being transported as, as substrates. We've also got another word called ligand, but I'm going to get to that later when we talk about receptors. We also have sometimes more than one form of enzyme around, either in different individuals or we have multiple versions of the same enzyme in, in the cell for need for redundancy. Maybe a one enzyme will work in one situation and another will work in another. For instance, you have certain enzymes that might work in your mouth to break down carbohydrates, but those enzymes won't work well in the small intestine. So you release other enzymes that can do the same thing, only they do it in the conditions of the small intestine. And that word is called isozyme. So you have an amylase that's in your, in your mouth, particularly when you're really, really hungry. Have you ever had that first nacho chip at a, at a, at a Mexican restaurant? It tastes so good, right? Well, by the end of the meal, you eat one of them, another one of those, and it tastes like cardboard. That's because the, the, cattle, the, uh, the enzyme, the amylase, has diminished in your mouth. But we also have a pancreatic amylase. It does the same thing, but under different conditions. It's a little more, um, little more acid. It's, uh, you know, the, the pH is different in the, in the, uh, in the small intestine. But enzymes lower the amount of activation energy, and that's how they speed up chemical reactions. They make those reactions more spontaneous, more sensitive to ambient um, temperatures in the environment. So we control the enzymes. If enzymes control the reactions, in physiology, we're going to control and regulate those enzymes so that we can control the reactions. This is an enzyme right here. This is a really, really cool one. This is a whole family of these. And if you look in the middle here, there's an ATP molecule in there. This protein, and it is a, a protein, converts ATP, the, the gamma phosphate, into light. It is a fluorescent protein. So if you see a, a lightning bug out in the, in, the, in the grass in the summertime, you're seeing this protein do its thing. It's hydrolyzing ATP and creating light. Here's another, this is actually a protein complex here. You can see that, uh, you see these red things inside and the blue things inside the, the molecule here as it spins around? Those are uh, an example of some place where we might be able to control this. Uh, when I say we, I mean cells and, and the body can control the rate of, this, the, the, of how this protein catalyzes the reaction by modifying these areas inside this protein. We're going to talk about that. We're going to break some of this stuff out. And for our final slide for this part one, I want to show you a protein that I was working with. Actually, I was working with both of these proteins. This one in yellow here is a protein called MUNK18. And this protein down here, though it's shown in its non-space filling form, it's just shown in its, uh, in its ribbon and stick figure, is called syntaxin, and these proteins are interacting together. Syntaxin is involved in diabetes synthesis. It is an enzyme. It helps the vesicles that contain insulin merge with the plasma membrane. If you just have a vesicle inside a cell, it will come up to the plasma membrane. It will literally bounce off of it. It's, a, it's energetically unfavorable for those vesicles to merge with the plasma membrane on their own. So you have this whole network of proteins in syntaxin 4 is one of them that helps pull that vesicle down and forces it to merge with that plasma membrane by, by physical force using ATP. Well, MUNK controls that protein a little bit and it can interact with it, but we also can control MUNK. You see these, these sites right here? I, I, I created these in a different color. These were all areas that we thought that could be modified chemically and that could control the ability of MUNK to bind to syntaxin 4 by, by adding or subtracting groups on these, on these uh, uh, side chains in, in, the, in the protein. And these are side chains of amino acids. We can change the shape of MUNK. And if we change the shape of MUNK, we change how it interacts with syntaxin 4 and how much insulin ultimately is released by a pancreatic cell. So this is where we're going to go in the next part. We're going to show you how we control the controllers. So I'm going to wrap up this, uh, this uh, uh, video, and I will talk to you in uh, part two of chapter four. Thanks for your time.